the title of the sermon this morning is Stand Firm Against Evolution. Stand Firm Against Evolution. Today we're starting a brand new sermon series called Stand Firm. And we have a theme verse that we're going to be looking at every Sunday during this series. It's going to last five weeks. Here's the theme verse. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says this. Be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Isn't that a good verse? Be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. The inspiration for this sermon series came from a statistic that I got from the Barna Research Group, and it's back in 2014. But it found that 60% of people who were raised in the church By the time they reach their 20s, they're no longer spiritually engaged. So 60%, 6 out of 10 people who are raised in the church, by the time they reach their 20s, they're no longer spiritually engaged. That means they're no longer attending church, they're no longer reading their Bible, they're no longer praying. And that's pretty sad. And so having a heart just for that next generation, it's easy for me to do that because I've got children who are, are still young. But I wanted to do something to help the young people in our church, stand firm in the faith and to help you as a parent help your kids to stand firm in the faith. But this series is really not just about young people. All of us have seen Christians, and maybe you were this person at one point in your life, but all of us us have seen Christians, a lot of Christians, fall away. You've seen Christians backslide. You've seen Christians stop going to church. You've seen Christians uh, get caught up into immorality and into gross disobedience to scripture. You may have have friends or family members that were one time walking faithfully with God, but then they got caught up in some false teaching or they got pulled away into a cult. Maybe you know of some Christians that even just stopped believing altogether, like, like they left the faith altogether. And that happens all too often. We've seen it, I've seen it in our church so many times. I've seen people just fall away. And what I want this sermon series to do is to encourage you to stand firm. Stand firm in the faith. Don't fall away. So what does it mean to stand firm? What does it mean to stand firm in the faith? It means five things if you want to take some notes. Number one, to stand firm means to hold on to sound doctrine no matter what. Hold on to sound doctrine. That word sound is used in scripture often and it means wholesome. It means healthy. Uh, It means right. Do you know what the word orthodox means? The word orthodox simply means correct. It means right. And so you could also say hold on to orthodox doctrine or to orthodoxy. Hold on to orthodoxy. And don't get on to some false teaching. Don't buy into the false teaching of the world or the false teaching of some cult out there uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Oneness Pentecostals or who don't believe in the Trinity uh, or the, the Mormons or, or we could go on and on. Hold on to sound doctrine. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, With all these things in mind, dear brothers, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the truth that we taught you in our letters and during the time we were with you. So I love that. Stand firm and keep a strong grip on the truth. Stand firm, keep a strong grip on the truth. Don't get pulled away, get caught up into some false teaching. Stand firm on sound doctrine. Okay, number two, to stand firm means to stay active in church no matter what. Stay active in church no matter what. Whether you live here in Acadiana or you move away to Texas um, or you get mad at me or somebody in our church lets you down, it doesn't matter. Stay active in church. If you have to leave our church, that happens sometimes, but stay active in church. Find another church immediately and plug in. You know, I've talked to people who they were going to church at some point in their lives and Somebody in the church did something that offended them. And I know of one couple who um, they wanted to get, to get married. And because they were, I forget the reason, they might have been living together before marriage or something, but the, the pastor said, I can't marry you unless you do this, this, and this. Well, they got mad, and that was about 40 years ago, and they decided they're never going to church again. And that's like going to a restaurant, and the food is undercooked, And so you say, I'm never going back to a restaurant again. And you've just condemned all restaurants are bad because of that one bad experience. Well, let me just save you the time. Every church is bad because every church is filled with sinful people like you and me 
but stay active in church as an obedient Christian. You cannot be obedient as a Christian and be inactive in church. And so uh, here's what uh, Scripture says, Hebrews 10.25. It says, Some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. So stay active in church. You know, studies are showing that in America, people are attending church less and less. Now, they're, they're not sure why exactly. I guess it's hard to pinpoint why. But people who used to go to church every week are now going to church, church three times. I'm sorry, used to go to church every week are now going to church three times a month. People who used to go to church twice a month are now going to church once a month. People who used to go to church about once a month are now going to church about six times a year. You know, a lot of people don't realize, because we don't keep attendance and you don't keep your own attendance, but a lot of people think they are regular church attenders, but if somebody kept a record of their attendance, they would be shocked to find out, I've only been to church 10 times this year, or I've only been to church 13 times this year out of 52 weeks. Wow. Be an every weeker. Mark it off on your calendar. I'm going to church on Sunday. If church is not a priority, God will not be a priority in your life, okay? Number three, to stand firm means to maintain an intimate love relationship with God no matter what. Maintain an intimate love relationship with God no matter what. That means keep praying, keep studying your Bible, keep having a quiet time, uh, listen to sermons online, get more you know, spiritual content, however you want. Go to YouTube and watch great um, instructional videos, Bible teaching, uh, listen to great Christian music. Do whatever you have to do to maintain a close relationship with the Lord. John 15, 4 says, Remain in me, this is Jesus talking, Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. So what that means is you cannot be who God created you to be and do all that God has planned for you to do. You can't produce and be productive as the person God wants you to be unless you stay close to Jesus. Stay close and fruit happens. Spiritual growth, in ter- fruit in terms of spiritual growth and fruit in terms of just you uh, accomplishing what God wants for you to accomplish. You've got to stay close, fruit happens. But your job is to stay close. You've got to stay close. All right, number four, to stand firm means to keep serving God. No matter what. Keep serving God no matter what. You're not here just to take up space. The church is not a cruise ship. It's a rescue ship. And God has called every Christ follower to get out of the stands and get onto the field and be a player. And we have a mission that God has given us. Here it is in Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples to all nations. That's the mission of our church, to make disciples here in Acadiana and to contribute to the making of disciples around the world. And God has called you to be a part of that. And so keep serving the Lord. Find a way to contribute to the church through your tithes and offerings. Find a way to contribute to the church by volunteering in some way. Um, uh, But also serve the Lord wherever you are, at work, at home, with your brothers and sisters, with your with your spouse. And but serve the Lord at work. Glorify God in everything that you do. Be a witness. Keep serving the Lord. Don't stop that. And then number five, to stand firm means to keep pursuing righteousness no matter what. Keep pursuing God's right way of living no matter what. Righteousness, Christ likeness. Don't give in to sinful, immoral living. Listen, don't just do it for God's sake. And don't just do it for our church's sake. Do it for your own sake. Sin is its own punishment. And and most of you know that from experience. Don't give in to sinful living. And if if you have a moral lapse, if you have a moral failure, what do you do? Don't turn it into a lifestyle. Don't make it a habit, a pattern. Immediately repent. Confess your sins to the Lord. And and, and get back on track with, with God. Okay, but keep pursuing righteousness no matter what. Matthew 6, 33 is my favorite verse in the Bible. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. God promises as you put him first, seek first his right way of living, he's going to take care of you. He's going to keep you 
on his path for your life, the best pathway for your life, okay? Now, that's what it means to stand firm, and I'm going to review those every week in this series. Now, let's talk about our approach in this sermon series. As I thought about why some people fall away, why some people don't stand firm, one of the main reasons is because of false teaching. It's because of false ideas, lies that we hear over the airways in our culture, whether it's at school or on TV. And one of the main reasons that Christian, Christians fall away, whether it's young people or adults, is because they buy in to these lies, these false teachings. They're so deadly. And so I took five of the big lies in our culture right now, and we're going to look at those in this sermon series. Five destructive lies. Let's just go over them real quick. The first one that we're going to look at today is evolution. And this is what the lie of evolution says. And by the way, some of you guys, I encourage you to, you, to down, you can go online and you can download my sermon manuscript. You'll be able to do that this evening. I'll have it posted for you. But I encourage you to download this and you can use it with your kids to, to talk them through these issues each week. Uh, but evolution, the lie is that people are not a special act of creation. They evolved naturally from monkeys. All right, that's the first lie. Uh, it sounds silly, but uh, you'd be surprised at how many of your neighbors believe that. Number two, the lie of atheism. God does not exist. The material world is all there is. God does not exist. The material world is all there is. Number three, the third lie is that we're going to look at is pluralism. Pluralism is the idea that there are many paths to heaven. Jesus is not the only way. It's completely unbiblical. It's very politically correct. And uh, by the way, usually anytime something's very politically correct, that means it's probably unbiblical. Okay? Now, the next one is annihilationism. Annihilationism. I might be teaching you a new word in this sermon series. Annihilationism simply means that some people go to heaven. And those that don't just cease to exist. They're annihilated whenever they die. Uh, other, there are different versions of annihilationism, like Jehovah's Witnesses believe that some people go to hell, but they don't stay there that long. Eventually, they just are annihilated and they cease to exist. The idea of an eternal hell is rejected by annihilationists. And so we're going to talk about that. And then number five, the fifth lie that we're going to look at is sexual liberation. And this really came out in the 1960s with the sexual revolution. This was the big lie that revolutionized our country. The lie is this. The Bible's restrictions on sex are harmful. Happiness can only be found through total sexual freedom. Now, that, that was the big lie in the 1960s. They rejected the Bible's ideas and traditional ideas of the family and of sexuality, and they said, actually, that if you follow the Bible's restrictions on morality, it actually leads to neurosis. It actually leads to mental illness. And so that, uh, tons of people bought into that lie, and, and that has led to actually now the LGBT revolution that we're seeing today. That all goes back to the 1960s and to this lie here. And so we're really, when it comes to this one, we're really going to be focusing on homosexuality and transgenderism and what the Bible says about those topics. Um, you know, I had a guy that was coming to our church for a while, and then one day I saw on his Facebook page, he posted something that said, I'm okay with gay. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, that just makes me feel like such a failure as a, as a pastor. Now listen, we love everybody. God loves everybody. We love gay people, but we're not okay with gay. Not as Christians. That's a sin. And so I want to make sure that you know that and that you don't get pulled into that nonsense. Okay? So let's get into evolution, the subject of evolution this morning. Here's the lie of evolution again. People are not a special act of creation by God. They evolved naturally from monkeys. All right, now there are different ways that you can describe or define the theory of evolution. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's one way to do it. Now, I remember the first time that I was exposed to evolution in school. And I was in sixth grade at Youngsville Middle School. And my mom was prepared. I was going to, as I said, Youngsville Middle School. And when we got to the unit on evolution in my science class, my mom had already worked it out with my science teacher and with the principal and I guess with the school board. I don't know who she had to go through. But the, to take me out of class while my class went through that unit. And so during that unit, which lasted probably a week, week and a half, two weeks, every day when it was time for science class, instead of going to my science class, I would actually go to the library 
and I wor worked on that a special project for me to work on, work on instead of um, that unit on evolution. Now, some people would, would criticize that and say, oh, you're, so, so you grew up, your parents wanted you to be ignorant. They didn't want you to be exposed to, to all those ideas. Believe me, I already had been exposed to evolution. My parents taught me all about evolution. My church taught me all about evolution. I mean, it's, it's coming through the airways constantly. You watch PBS, uh, public television, and they're teaching evolution constantly through all the children's programs. So I was very aware of evolution. What my mom didn't want, what my mom and dad didn't want, is they didn't want me to hear from my science teacher, whom I respected and trusted, that evolution was settled fact, that it was established science, that it was absolutely true, there was no doubt about it, that there were no other opinions, so that every other opinion, every other uh, idea about the origins of the universe and the origins of life is wrong. That's what they didn't want me to hear, that just a one-sided version of the creation evolution debate. And so my mom and dad were very wise in doing that and keeping me out of that class during that unit. Because, and they didn't do that every year. It was just that sixth grade year, the first year that, I was, that, that they taught evolution in, 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 uh, to kids in, in public school, the, the, the earliest age, I should say. But my parents were very wise because of this. Evolution directly contradicts the Bible. And I'm going to show you that this morning in eight different ways that evolution and the Bible contradict one another. But evolution and the Bible contradict each other. They cannot both be true. You cannot believe in evolution and believe in the Bible or vice versa. And so if a science teacher can teach a sixth grader that evolution is true, established fact, settled science, then she has just by default taught that sixth grader that the Bible is wrong. And then if she can teach, the, without even saying, the Bible is wrong. And if she has already taught a sixth grader that the Bible cannot be trusted on the matters of origins, if the Bible is wrong, then she's just convinced that sixth grader that Christianity is wrong. And many, many people leave the faith because of this very issue, because of the theory, the lie of evolution. And so let's talk about it. What is evolution? Evolution. In 1859, Charles Darwin, uh, he published a book, one of the most influential books of all time now, called The Origin of Species. And uh, let me summarize Darwin's theory uh, with the words of Dr. R.C. Sproul, a great theologian who just recently passed away. He said, in the book The Origin of Species, Darwin theorizes that all living organisms on earth have descended from a single primordial form, from that single source all varieties of life have evolved and continue to evolve. And then Sproul goes on and describes the three major premises of Darwin's theory. He says, number one, each, and you may, you may, may have never heard these before, but number one, each individual member of a given species is different. Take dogs, for example. There are many different kinds of dogs. Okay, so, and, and really, each member, take human beings, every human being is different, right? We're all different. Number two, that's true, we can agree with that. Number two, the second premise, in nature, the weaker varieties of animals or plants are killed off by the stronger varieties due to their better ability to compete for food or withstand environmental changes. This is called survival of the fittest or natural selection or adaptation. And so, we can agree with that, too. That's absolutely, a, you know, we've seen, we, can, we can see that in, in, in nature. And then number three, he says, this process, Darwin thought, would cause the surviving variety of a species to improve over time and evolve or change, that's what evolve means, to change into a completely new species. Now, that's where we have to stop, and that's where we have to talk about this. Everyone affirms adaptation or natural selection. In other words, it's possible for wolves to adapt over time. For example, wolves can change depending on their environment. They can change colors. They can change uh, the length of their hair. They can change, their teeth can change and adapt and, and, and uh, be longer or shorter. Um, the speed that they run can change. Maybe even the sound of their howl can change over time, and we can agree with that. We've seen that. In fact, we can even speed up the process of, 
of adaptation through artificial breeding. Scientists can do this. But what Darwin was saying was that as these wolves continue to adapt and continue to adapt over millions of years, eventually that wolf will turn into a completely different kind of animal, like a horse. <laughs> That's what Darwin's theory was, that eventually a wolf becomes a chicken or something like that. It's a completely different kind of animal. And that's where we have to disagree with Darwin and with the theory of evolution. Because in real life, we've seen adaptation occur. We've seen wolves or dogs change, many different varieties of dogs. But dogs always remain dogs. Dogs always stay dogs. And that's why we have to disagree. Now, let me show you the differences between the Bible and evolution. And by the way, there are just two different words that, you, that I want to introduce to you, if you haven't heard these before. But the two words are microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution, everybody agrees with. Microevolution is a change within a species. And so wolves can change in, into different kinds of wolves. And, and dogs can change into different kinds of dogs. Um, people can change into different looking people. Um, but that's microevolution macroevolution is really what Dar Darwin taught. That's Darwinian evolution, and that's whenever um, a monkey turns into a human. A monkey turns into a person. Let's talk about the differences between the Bible and evolution and why we can't be evolutionists as Christians. Number one, the Bible says that God created each animal according to its kind. It actually uses that language, kind. By the way, what's a kind? You know, you have species and all, all the different words and science for all the different uh, types of animals. What is a kind? A kind is basically the simplest way to understand what a kind of animal is, is if two animals can reproduce, then they're of the same kind, okay? So in Genesis 1, 24 through 25, it says, Then God said, Let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. It's like God was being very specific for us here. And God saw that it was good. And so when God created the earth, God created horses, and God created dogs, and God created uh, eagles. God didn't start one single primordial life form that over time evolved into all the different species. And that's what evolution says. Evolution says that all species originated from one single-celled organism, which then evolved or changed into the many different kinds of animals that we have today. And so that completely contradicts the Bible. Number two, the Bible says that people are made in the image of God different from all other animals. This is perhaps the most important difference between evolution and the Bible and creation. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Perhaps some Trinitarian language there. God is three in one. They will rule, people will, people will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now, to be created in the image of God doesn't simply mean that we are more intelligent than animals. What it means is we're, we're in a completely different category. There are things that no other creature can do for example, it means that we have the capacity for moral reasoning. We can discern right and wrong. We can think about what's moral, what's ethical, what's immoral. We feel it in our hearts whenever something is wrong or right. It means also that we have the ability for altruistic love. In other words, we have the ability to, be, to sacrifice ourselves for other people when it doesn't make sense, like it's nothing, there's nothing in it for us. We can, human beings can give of themselves, like Mother Teresa is a great example, who went over there to India and Calcutta, and she, she sacrificed her life for all of these sick, diseased, dying people. She sacrificed her whole life for these people. What was in it for her? Money? No. Fame? Not that she could enjoy. She stayed there in India. 
I mean, what was it? Comfort? Luxury? No. Nothing was in it for her, but she sacrificed herself out of love for these people. Only human beings have the ability to do that. And then we also have the ability for spiritual perception. We can have a relationship with God and with the spirit world and the spirit realm. Uh, Animals don't have this. Now, what evolution teaches is that human beings are just another kind of animal. We're just a much more intelligent animal. And that leads to all kinds of atrocities. That's why over 100 million people were killed in the 20th century. It's because the communist leaders and, and Hitler, these were all believers in evolution, which simply teaches that people are just animals. And so if it's okay to experiment on animals, then why not experiment on people? And if it's okay to put, put to death these weak and diseased uh, animals, why can't you put to death these weak and diseased people? So, number three, the third difference is that the Bible says God made people and all animal kinds in the beginning. God made people and all animal kinds in the beginning. Exodus 20.11 says, For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Now let me tell you what I believe the Bible says. I believe the Bible says that uh, God created everything in six consecutive 24-hour days. And so that means the earth is not billions of years old, and the universe is not billions of years old. It's only thousands of years old. Um, And Jesus affirmed this in Matthew 19.4. He says, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? So God created human beings in the beginning. In other words... All these people and animal kinds didn't emerge gradually at different times in history through the process of evolution. No, God created all the original animal kinds in the beginning together. Evolution says that different kinds of animals evolved and emerged at different times, sometimes separated by millions of years. And so, uh, you know, there, was, there, there were monkeys or apes, and then maybe a million years later, then people emerged. No, the Bible says God created monkeys in the beginning and God created people in the beginning. All right, number four. The fourth difference is that the Bible says that people and animals were created supernaturally. Not naturally, supernaturally. People and animals were created supernaturally. Genesis 1, 20 through 21 says, Then God said, Let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, the Bible doesn't say that God created one single-celled organism and that everything evolved naturally over millions of years through natural processes into all the different species and kinds of animals that we have today. We didn't come about, creation didn't come about through natural processes. It was a supernatural miracle. God spoke life, spoke creation into being. And that's what the Bible says is is different than evolution. Number five, the Bible says that people and animals exist because of divine intent. The Bible says that people and animals exist because of divine intent. Creation, all of creation exists because of divine intent. When you read Genesis chapter 1, you see these same words over and over again. Then God said, then God said, then God said. Everything came from what God said. God spoke things into into being. In other words, people and animals and you are not here by chance or by accident. You're here because God decided and planned and intended for you personally to be here. And that's very different from evolution. Evolution says we're all just here by accident. It's just by chance that you and I are here, sitting here today, that you and I exist, that humanity even exists. It's all by chance, all by accident. The Bible says, number six, the Bible says that creation exists to glorify and serve God. The Bible says that creation exists to glorify and serve God. Colossians 1.16 says of Jesus, For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Notice this. All things have been created through him and for him. We have a purpose. You have a purpose. You're here for a reason. That's to serve and glorify God. But according to evolution, 
It says that since we're here by accident, by chance, and we weren't created, we just evolved over millions of years, you have no inherent purpose. You have no inherent meaning. You can just kind of make up your own values. You can make up your own purpose. You can make up your own rules. You're here by accident. Number seven, the Bible says that life began on land. Life began on land. Did you know that the, if you read the, the, the book of Genesis in the first chapter, the first life forms were not animals and, and people. They were plants, and they were on land. But evolution says that all life came out of the sea. And so that directly contradicts what the Bible says. God created animals and people on the fifth and sixth days, but he created plants and trees on the third day. Evolution says that life began in the ocean. Number eight, the Bible says that man was created from the dust. I heard a preacher preach a whole sermon called Butt Dust. He says, you are, because the Bible says, you are but dust. Genesis 1-7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. So mankind came from the dust, and God created, a, created Adam right then and there in one, one act of creation, in, in one moment, not over millions of years, whereas evolution says we came naturally through the process of evolution over a long, long time from apes, from monkeys, from primates. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Evolution in the Bible contradict in many other ways. But I just wanted to show you that you can't believe in both. You can't believe in the Bible and evolution. Now, what if evolution is true? If evolution is true, I want you to think about the implications here. If evolution is true, then the Bible is wrong about creation. It's wrong. If evolution is true, then Jesus was wrong about creation. Because in, 19, in Matthew 19.4, he affirmed creation. So if evolution is true already, the Bible is wrong and Jesus is wrong. If evolution is true, then the Bible and Jesus cannot be trusted. If evolution is true, then we cannot know who God is. Because the only way we know who God is is through his revelation, through his self-revelation, through scripture and through Christ. But if those things can't be trusted, then we have no idea who God is. We may know that there is a God just by looking at nature and looking at the universe, and all this had to come from somewhere, but we can't know who God is. Number five, if evolution is true, then we cannot know the meaning of life, because we get that from the Bible. If evolution is true, then we cannot know right from wrong, because the only way we know right from wrong is by knowing God's character. That's what determines right from wrong. But without the Bible, we don't know what God's character is. Therefore, we don't know right from wrong. And then number Number seven, if evolution is true, then we cannot know how to get to heaven. And so there's some huge things at stake here when it comes to the theory of evolution. But the, the good news is that evolution is a lie. The Bible is true. I want you to believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, that may be the most important verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very quickly, five reasons to believe in creation and not evolution. Five reasons. I'm going to go over these as briefly as possible so I can get you out of here and you can go to lunch. Number one, the Bible teaches creation, and the Bible is true. First reason to believe in creation is because the Bible teaches it. The Bible is God's word. Now, the Bible claims this for itself. In 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says of itself, all scripture is inspired by God. The word inspired means that God chose every word and, in, 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 through certain authors, about 40 different authors, God told them exactly what to write. There, the Bible has many different writers, but only one author. Now, if God authored every single word in the Bible and God never lies, then what does that mean about Scripture? The scripture is absolutely inerrant. Without error, it's true. It can be trusted. Psalm 19.7 says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord, that's talking about the Bible, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. There's only one thing that you can really trust in this world completely, and that's the Bible. You know, science makes changes all the time. They make mistakes all the time. 
um, uh, science told my grandparents that the best thing for their children was to nurse them, was to breastfeed. But then with my parents' generation, science told my parents' generation that the best thing was formula, don't breastfeed. (laughs) That's not good for them. But then my generation, science flip-flopped again and said, well, the best thing for your kids is you need to breastfeed. Don't, Don't put them on formula if you can help it. Science makes changes all the time. Science uh, at one point said that caffeine is bad for you. They get these new studies out all the time. If you'll just just watch the news, there's a new study comes out all the time. Caffeine's bad for you. Then another one comes out and says, if you drink one cup of coffee a day, you'll live five years longer. And and so science changes all the time. Did y'all know this, that uh, the science says that, uh, used to say that flossing was really good for you, and I floss every day. There's a new study that came out that said flossing does absolutely no good for you. Science changes its mind all the time, but God's word never changes. It's never been proven wrong. It's always only been proven right. 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25 says, The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Number two, the second reason to believe in creation is that Jesus taught creation, and he is God. (laughs) Where was Jesus during creation? He was there. He was the one who was creating everything. And Jesus then came to earth, walked the earth, died on the cross, rose from the grave, proving that he was God. And so I'm going to believe Jesus, who was an eyewitness at creation. He was there. Remember in Matthew 19, 4, Jesus affirmed creation. Haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? He was quoting Genesis 1, 27. And so Jesus... If Jesus believed in creation, then we can too. Number three, third reason to believe in creation and not evolution, evolution has never been observed. It's never been observed. And so there are different kinds of animals, right? There's the feline kind, and so that would be like a cat and a lion and a tiger. And then there's the canine kind, that would be like a wolf and a poodle and maybe a German shepherd. And then there's the human kind, all right? And then you got... You got black and you got white and you got yellow and you got red and all the different colors and and sizes. Now, Darwinian evolution claims that one kind of animal eventually changes into a completely different kind of animal. The only problem is that that has never been observed. And that's kind of a problem for scientists because science is supposed to be based on the scientific method which is based on observation and testing and repetition, scientists have never observed Darwinian evolution. They've never observed one animal changing into a different kind of animal. I heard somebody say, if people come from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? I thought that was funny. Glenn Sunshine said, interestingly enough, Darwin's theory does not fit the definition of science. For a theory to be scientific, it must also be validated through the scientific method. A theory is proposed and predictions are made from it. I mean, you learn this in sixth grade science class. These predictions are then tested through experimentation. If the experiment fails, the theory must be discarded or modified. If this experiment succeeds, it does not prove the theory truth, but it does make it more probable that the theory is correct. Darwinism itself is not subject to the scientific method any more than anything in history is. The past is over. You cannot revisit it, observe it, test it, or experiment on it. All you can do is look at the surviving evidence and try to make sense of it. And so it's funny whenever scientists try to talk so definitively about what happened four billion years ago. It's like, what? So you were there? No, you don't know what happened four billion years ago. Okay, all right, number, number four. Fourth reason to believe in creation is that there are no transitional fossils. There are no transitional fossils. Darwin actually explained how to refute his theory or how his theory could be proven false. He said if his theory was true, then eventually the fossil record would show countless transitional fossils. In other words, a transitional fossil is, let's say that, that a fish turned into a bird well, then you should be able to go underground and look at the fossils and see, okay, here's this fish that turned into this bird. And so in between and all these, you know, millions of years of sediment, uh, you should be able to see that this, this fish turned into this animal and then turned into this animal and eventually became this. These in the middle are all transitional fossils. They're just showing the, the transition. 
And so Darwin said, if his theory was true, as scientists or archaeologists discovered more fossils, they should see transitional fossils. Well, since Darwin's theory, archaeologists have uncovered hundreds of thousands of fossils all over the world, and they've never found any transitional fossils. Never. Uh, Darwin actually said, why then is not every stratum and every geological formation full of such intermediate links or transitional forms, fossils? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic change, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. So according to Darwin, this refutes his theory. We still haven't found these transitional fossils. In fact, a few years back, archaeologists discovered a layer of rock called the Cambrian Explosion. And what they found was that most major groups of complex animals just suddenly appear, and not by gradual evolution. They just suddenly appear. What does that sound like you, to you? That doesn't sound like evolution. That sounds like creation. And so scientists, archaeologists, have found two things that refute Darwin's theory when it comes to fossils. Number one, no transitional fossils. Number two, what they've actually found is fossils that suddenly appear with nothing underneath it, no transitional fossils. All right, number five, the fifth reason to believe in creation is irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity, a very important term, and I hope I can explain this to you. But here's the other way that Darwin explained that his theory could be refuted. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And so what Darwin meant was, was this. Imagine a simple mousetrap. And a mousetrap that has five parts. You know, the regular kind of mousetrap that you might have in your pantry during the wintertime. And a mousetrap's parts are a platform, the hammer, the spring, the catch, and the hold-down bar. I don't know if you ever noticed that a mousetrap has five parts. Now, if you take away any of those five parts of a mousetrap, then it ceases to be a mousetrap. It ceases to have any function at all. It's not a mousetrap. It doesn't work. And so there's no way that a mousetrap could, could, could have evolved from just this base, you know, the platform, and then it would get the hammer over time, and then over time it would get a spring. That doesn't make sense because without all five parts together, it's nothing. It has no purpose, no function. It wouldn't evolve. It's nothing. It's irreducibly complex. It can't be reduced. Well, Darwin knew if you could find a living organ that's like that, an organism that was irreducibly complex, that couldn't have evolved slowly over time, then his theory would be debunked. If you could find a complex living organism uh, that couldn't possibly have evolved because to take away any of its parts would make it completely pointless and inoperable, then you could disprove evolution. A few years ago, a scientist by the name of Michael Behe took Darwin up on his challenge, and he's the one who uh, coined the term irreducible complexity. He defines it as a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function wherein the removal of any one of these parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. And so if something can't function without one of its parts, then it couldn't have gradually evolved over time. When Darwin came up with his theory, they thought cells were just little black boxes. They didn't have electron microscopes that we have today to, to peer inside of a cell. Now we can see what's going on in a cell, and one of the things that we've discovered is some irreducibly complex organs, like the flagellum. A flagellum is what's attached. It's like a, a tail to some of the bacteria. And here's how Na Nancy Piercy describes a flagellum. This is very, very small. It's a microscopic outboard rotary motor that comes equipped with a hook joint, a drive shaft, O-rings, a stator, and a bidirectional acid-powered motor that can hum along up to 100,000 revolutions per minute. Structures like, structures like these require dozens of precisely tailored, intricately interacting parts which could not emerge by any gradual process. Instead, the coordinated parts must somehow appear on the scene all at the same time, combined and coordinated in the right patterns for the molecular machine to function at all. And so whenever you take the fossil record, the transitional forms that don't exist, 
And whenever you take the, the idea of irreducible complexity, which now we've found several life forms, several organs or organisms that, that fit that definition of irreducible complexity, Darwin, by his own definition, his theory has been debunked. And so I want to encourage you to stand firm against evolution. It's not true. This is why in 2007, you can go online to the Discovery Institute. And in 2007, they had over 700 scientists from around the world who signed a statement that expressed their skepticism with Darwinian evolution. Now, there's thousands and thousands of signatures on that list. And these are scientists from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Dartmouth, Rutgers, Stanford, Berkeley, Princeton, MIT. In 2005, a poll found that 60% of American doctors reject Darwinian evolution. So the majority of our doctors in America don't believe this baloney. In the book Dar Darwinism, the Refutation of a Myth, the Swedish embryologist Soren Lovetrup says that he believes that someday Darwinism will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. One of these days, it's going it's to be it's going to come out. Eventually, the scientists are going to have to, these evolutionists are going to have to admit, all right, there's just no way this could be true. It would be the greatest myth in the history of science. The Bible is true. God created the heavens and the earth. God made you. You didn't come from monkeys. And God made you with a purpose. In 2014, a few years ago, my family was in, um, in Deritter, so we decided to, to drive to Lake Charles to see a movie for Mary's birthday. And we went to see the movie... Uh, unbroken. And it's the amazing true story of Louis Zamperini. How many of you have seen that, that story? Uh, it's a true story of an Olympic runner who enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. In 1943, Louis and 10 others are sent on a rescue mission. And their plane crashed into the ocean. Only Louis and two others survived. And they lived on two inflatable rafts. They drifted for 2,000 miles with only a few bottles of water and six chocolate bars. When they ran out of those supplies, they survived on rainwater, fish, and birds. After 33 days at sea, one of the men died. Finally, on the 47th day, Louis and his friend were rescued, but not by Americans, by the enemy. The Japanese got them out of the ocean and took them to POW camps in Japan. Louis was sent to a camp in Tokyo where he was beaten often by the leader of the camp, Corporal Watanabe. On one occasion, Watanabe forced every prisoner to punch Louis in the face. One time, Watanabe ordered Louis to lift a large beam above his head. Think about like a 4x4 a, a four four or 6x6 six six beam above his head. And he ordered a guard to shoot him if he dropped it. And so Louis held it, despite extreme exhaustion, for 37 minutes <laughs> while looking Watanabe in the eye. This angered Watanabe, who then beat Louis severely. Louis spent two years in POW camps. He endured disease, starvation, almost daily beatings with clubs, belts, fists. Eventually, he made it back to the States. He lived a long life, just recently passed away at 97 years old after losing a battle, a 40-day battle with pneumonia. As I thought about standing firm, I couldn't help but think about that image of Louis standing with that beam. Have you ever tried to, to keep your arm up, to raise your arm and just keep it up for as long as you can? After about a minute or so, you start to get tired. Your arm gets really heavy. Okay, so... Louis standing there with this heavy beam for 37 minutes. He was standing firm. And that's my encouragement to you today, that you will be bullied when it comes to the theory of evolution. They'll tell you that scientists, all scientists believe in evolution. You'll be told that evolution is based on science and creation is based on superstition. You'll be told that evolution deniers are stifling technological pro uh, progress. And you'll be told that only fools believe in creation. I want to encourage you, stand firm in the faith. God made you. God made everything. Evolution's a lie. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you so much, Lord, for the Bible, that we can know who we are, where we came from, who you are, where we're going, how to go to heaven, what the meaning of life is. It's so good to know, Lord, that we didn't come from monkeys. It's so good to know that you made us. 
you crafted us just as we are for a purpose and that you love us and that you're with us. You died on the cross for us. It shows our value. Lord, we pray for the students and for everybody in here, Lord, to stand firm against evolution and to keep believing in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.